No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today, I am very, very pleased to prevent you, present you all with an absolute legend in the game. I feel like a legend. Appreciate, appreciate you guys having me. Silk the Shocker is in the building, ladies here, and gentlemen. I'm here. I'm here. Glad to be here, my brother. Glad to be here. Glad to be here for sure. How you feeling, man? I feel good. I feel good. Fresh off a of flight, but you know, come to see you, my guy, and I appreciate it, man. What else you got going on in LA while you're out here? Um, a film. Uh, we I, I did a, a music book um, called Paved. Um, so I was seeing an ad for this. Okay. Yeah. What yeah. is this all about? Might as well get that out the way. Um, it's a book. So what I did was, you know, um, people ask me a lot of times about success in the music business and stuff like mm. that. So. Um, instead of having the time to always, you know, tell everybody, you know, this, that, um, the keys to why we were successful and stuff like that, I feel like make a book, mm. let them, you know, they, they don't have to ask as much and I can get more information like that. So, yeah. Because I mean, signing to a label or getting involved mm -hmm. in the music industry in general is the kind of thing where it comes so naturally to people that mm -hmm. they'll just figure it out. Like, oh, I'm, I'm going to figure everything out. I'll, I'll sort mm -hmm. of learn by experience. Mm -hmm. But then in reality, in the music industry, that first contract you sign might basically dictate the terms by which you're doing business for the rest of your career. Yeah. So there's so much to gain mm -hmm. for a young artist to, to just know a lot in mm -hmm. the beginning or mm -hmm. to have somebody who has their back that really understands the game. Yeah. But more often than not, they have to learn through experience and they basically get screwed in the whole deal. Yeah, because it's a learning, um, you know, it's an on-job process. So I'm saying so... Think about um, it was stuff that we had to go through that if we had somebody to tell us what it was, we would have yeah. we would have done better. But of course, we was good. But I think um, just having somebody to or at least have a, a blueprint from somebody who kind of went through it. We did a lot of ups and downs. Um, I would say we had, uh, you know, some deals that wasn't good, but mm. the longevity in it was that we still was able to do it. But some people only get one shot at it. Mm. So I think with us, we was able to um, keep going. Yeah. I mean, if you look at like what No Limit did in the music mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're borderline like, you know, Google, Facebook, like yeah. coming in the game, yep. there are no rules. There's mm -hmm. no like, mm -hmm. you know, standard by mm -hmm. which people from the streets mm -hmm. should be able to basically create their own business like this. Yep. And y'all figured it out so that that process can be relatively smooth for the current generation. And so there could yeah. be all these different companies yeah. in place who basically, you know, when you look at an empire, you look mm -hmm. at a tune core, you look at all these different companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, they basically exist to smooth out the revenue streams mm -hmm. that you guys had to figure out for yourself. You know what? You just nailed it. Um, that's it. Um, we didn't have a no limit for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had some good artists, but we didn't have a no limit that would, would do it where it was um, independent, um, you can keep a lot of ownership um, and still do what you got to do. So that that was the part where, um, and even now, you know, I feel like the internet is a good thing if you could use it the correct way, right? Is mm -hmm. um, we had to go hand in hand. Um, it was no blueprint to do that type of business, but um, you know, the good thing about it, we was probably hustling. We was hustlers. Uh, we figured it out, and I think um, most people don't have that that longevity to be able to figure it out. They mm -hmm. just have that. Um, and so I wanted to give them like a somewhat of a blueprint. I can't give them all information, but I wanted to give them something where they feel, um, you know, it, it was helpful to them. Like it was, we had no help for us, Definitely. But, but just just figure it out. You know I mean, that? that's kind of what the brand name of, you know, what you and your family mm -hmm. have built over the years, mm -hmm. a large part of like when we talk about mm -hmm. No Limit, it's mm -hmm. the music. Yes, the mm -hmm. music was great and everything, but mm -hmm. more often than not, we're talking about the entrepreneurial part of it because yeah. that's the, really the thing mm -hmm. that No Limit was responsible mm -hmm. for. And, and, you know, a few other artists from that time period, but yeah. the majority of the credit goes to, to your family for really figuring that shit out before the internet made things a lot easier. Yeah. Well, no, you said it best. I, we would say musically we wasn't the greatest musicians, right? But we would just outwork everybody. We would just figure it out, um, you know, make something out of nothing. And um, that's what, and that's better to be known for more than, for the business part of it more than the rapping. The rapping, mm. you know, always you could everybody can rap, but everybody can do good business though, for sure. Y'all have some good ass music. Though, too, <laughs> yeah, man. that's true. That's true. Too. Ooh, when, that's true too. when I was getting ready for this interview, the 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 first time it, it must have been a few years since mm -hmm. I heard Hootie Who. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, I was just like, bro, this is one of the hardest songs yeah. in rap history. Yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> Evil ass lyrics. Yep, yep. Realistically, you know, I feel like maybe you guys as adults might not be one hundred percent on board with some of the <laughs> lyrical content. <laughs> yeah. But man, Man, what a hard song! Oh yeah, no, it was, we had some. No, we had some music, and then it's good to um, to listen to the music now, and uh, and realize where we was at in that space. I mean, mm. I, you'd never be able to duplicate that space either. But it was just we was in the studio making the music. It was like, oh my god, 
and you knew it was something coming out was crazy. Yeah. yeah. So I've been really, really enjoying um, the full uh, VH1 mm -hmm. documentary, The No Limit oh, yeah, Chronicles. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like two or three episodes in. I was unfortunately not able to finish it while I was mm -hmm. last night. I just really had to be like, all right, it's one in the morning. I'm no going problem, to bed. No problem. I, no, yeah. problem no problem. But I just found that shit to be so fascinating and well made because I kind of always wondered like who was going to really do the the excellent high quality mm -hmm. job mm -hmm. of telling mm -hmm. that story. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you know it's easy for them to make a movie about NWA. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's like you're going to war with the cops. You know, this yeah, is yeah, like a, it's yeah. an easy story yeah. to tell it a lot of ways. Yeah, Sometimes yeah. when I look at like a No Limit, it's like. Mm -hmm. It takes a little bit more work to show all mm -hmm. the characters because all the characters are important. Whereas yeah, with the yeah. NWA thing, it's more like you have a few central characters yeah. with no limit. I mean, you yeah. have so many different faces that were so important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, is that is, would you consider that like the best historical record that you've seen of that time in your life, or are there other things that you've seen over the years that you're like, oh, this this book did an amazing job of of talking about it, mm -hmm. or, or is this No Limit Chronicles thing the best shit that you've seen? I think the No Limit Chronicle is close um, and it's well done. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, some stuff uh, they could have went dug a little more deeper, but you know, you don't have enough time, right? Mm -hmm. So, but for the time they had, I think it was done. And I'm glad nobody, we didn't just do it just to put it together and like, oh, you know, we're going to put some video out. They really dug deep to find, you know, all the artists, people who was relevant to, um, to No Limit. And um, I think, th I mean, to date, I think this is probably the, the best visual, you know, that we ever seen mm. as far as somebody telling a story. Now, we got some other stuff coming up that's going to probably enlighten some of the stuff that you probably didn't know. But mm. I think for the most part, yeah, that was that was really good. And you do your homework. I see that. I see that. No, yeah. 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 I, I just love, like, really high-quality <laughs> historical documents yeah. about rap music. Like, there's an amazing mm. book about mm. uh, Pimp C. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, my God. Yeah, yeah. Julia Beverly wrote that. And okay. that just... The level of detail they went into in that book, mm -hmm. I was like, bro, many more rappers deserve this kind of treatment. Oh, okay. You know, really like canonizing yeah. their uh, their contributions to the culture and everything mm. that went on with them. You know, yeah. You know what, man? Sometimes you don't get that. You don't get that um, done, um, especially to that level. Um, sometimes we'll do something where, um, like you said, it'll just be something put together. Mm. But I, I want to say that. Even BET, they spent a lot of time, a lot of money, did a lot of resource searching on it. And, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. So I got to check that PMC thing out. Big, big fan of PMCs. It is like um, 800 pages, though. What? So it's, it's, not a, it's not a quick undertaking. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> that's that's, that's a, it's more than a quick, long flight. Yeah. <laughs> but sure. But, show, um, but the No Limit Chronicles thing mm -hmm. kind of like tells the whole story, mm -hmm. like primarily from the point of view of Master P. Yeah. And I'm very like interested because you had a, a front row seat to this yeah. whole development and stuff. Like, mm -hmm. did you notice early on that he had, and, and this is like the main conclusion you're forced to come away with from mm -hmm. the VH1 documentary is like, this dude is just a monster of an entrepreneur. Like he had that in him from mm -hmm. day one. Like yeah. it was going to be something one way oh, yeah. or another. Yeah. When did you first identify that he had a certain degree of, of, of work horse in him that mm -hmm. was going to really like be the driving force of, of so much stuff? I would say a long time ago, but it, it, it was done differently. So maybe it wasn't music. Maybe it was, um, I don't know. Hustling. Happy, yeah. Hustling, quote unquote. Happy, hustling. Exactly. That's what it is. Um, you know, maybe it's a car I'm trying to flip. Okay. I'm going to buy it for a load. I'm going to sell it for high, you know, stuff like that. Mm. So, it started out with stuff like that, and then it kind of transcended to like um, uh, whatever it might be. So if it's films or whatever, or if it's um, music. So if it's music, same thing. It's like okay, I'm gonna put a whole bunch of records out. I'm a, I'm a brand this certain way. So it was more of that. Um, and so that's been, I would say, it's it been that way for quite a while, mm -hmm. right? And it'll just be different stuff that would that would play a part in that. But if you have it for selling. Um, I don't know, TVs, you're gonna have it for selling, you know, I don't know, water, whatever it is, you know what right. I'm saying? Whatever it might be, um, you just have the same natural ability to do it. So most times people focus on the stuff they, they did before, right? So what it's all about realistically is like, what can you keep doing? So if you was doing something else, okay, now you're doing what you're doing now, and then what you're gonna do next, you're gonna, whatever you wanna do, you can do it. And that's that hustle you won't ever change basically yeah. you will be the same person but you would just take your hustle and then 
you know, magnified into something else. Because that's, what, that's what he said in the documentary. He's basically like, I was the peanut boy. You know, I was working yep. at the movie theater, like yep, selling, yep. doing anything to make mm -hmm. a buck. Mm -hmm. And then that seamlessly transitioned into the streets and then into mm -hmm. the music. And mm -hmm. one thing I wanted to ask is, is that something that runs in the family? Like, do you feel like you had that sort of same entrepreneurial um, ambition or mm. was it different in a way? Like, compare yourself to uh, that. No, it, well, if it wasn't in the beginning, it's definitely spread it to me for mm. sure. You know what I'm saying? So if I don't have, well, I'm young, first of all. I'm younger, so um, let's, say I, let's say I didn't know to that magnitude because let's say if you, the first person who jump off the porch, you have to figure stuff out sooner. Right. So me, I just looked at it more of... Um, you know, kind of like watching the process. So I was there from like day zero, right? So I'm like watching the trip from um, New Orleans to Houston to to Cali, right? So I'm 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 literally right there with Romeo in the back seat. He may be like a couple months old or something. I don't know. So you that's the process. Then we go to Richmond, open the store, um, and so I'm there. Like I'm I'm every meeting I'm there. Um, if you look at the song catalog, I think I'm on every song that's a hit. So mm. I, I'm just there all the time. What do you credit that for? Were you just staying in the studio and just really stayed working or, or what was that? Um, I would say, yep, I, I love to work. Um, I ain't like to do a lot of stuff like promoting, mm. but I just I want to tell my story. Um, and I think just being around it. Um, and they call me a lot, too. So when, when you have a, you know, a record of just being on the top songs, um, and being a big part of what's going on, then I think, you know, they, they get that call. So I'm, I'm around the studio, but I'm also getting those calls, too. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And also want to do it, too. You know what I'm saying? Did you feel like you guys were like, was there a real competition vibe in the studio? Because when I listen back to so much of the stuff and like mm -hmm. I can hear you and Mystical on songs together mm -hmm. and it just feels like you guys are both just absolutely going berserk. Like mm -hmm. it, it feels like there must have been a real sense of, of competition because there was just so much energy in the way mm. that you guys were rapping at that time. A lot of times now, mm. I love a lot of modern rap. Mm. A lot of times it feels like they're not competing. <laughs> they're just sort of getting on the song and rapping. Yeah, you're right. I would say um, it was a lot of competition. Um, it was also uh, we wanted to be the best. Mm. Um, and then we pushed each other to be the best. You see what I'm saying? So it was more like a constant if it was energy, so if you on make them say, uh, it's like, man, who got the best verse? Who gonna, you know, do this? So it was a constant, like, uh, in that environment, it was um, really motivating and really, you know, pushing you to be great. That's what it was. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like your particular rap style, though, like, mm. what, what, who influenced you to rap the way that you rapped? And, it feels like you 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 found kind of like a middle ground yeah. where you have like somebody like Mystical who's like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. really like listening to him in this day mm -hmm. and age. It's mm -hmm. like wow, that is a really fucking influential flow right now. There, there, that you could hear that same energy in a lot of people, whether it's you know six nine or mm -hmm. there's all these rappers or sort of trying mm -hmm. to do something that's just like really aggressive vocally. Mm -hmm. I felt like you found like a sweet spot kind of between like P and, and Mystical style wise. Like like how how would you identify what your style was at the time? I would say um, I did, um, but I just came out on unique style, right? Mm -hmm. So I was more like, um, you know, just uh, trying to figure something that was just me. So most people would be like, oh, you rap off beat, um, you know, a bunch of stuff. But but here's the thing. My fans, they appreciated that. Like, they appreciated Mystical. Um, so I, have, I had a different kind of flow before Mystical, and then when he came around, it made me – a little bit more mm -hmm. aggressive, right? But I was still doing the same aggressive flow with the stop and start, whatever, kind of offbeat a little bit. And um, yeah, for the most part, um, and to this day, people say, oh, you was offbeat, but then they want me to go back to my old style. That's what mm. they want. And, and a lot of rappers are doing it now, if you look at it, so it's cool. Have you know? lost interest in that? Like when you listen back to your old raps, mm -hmm. Does it feel like, oh, this was an amazing period in music and mm -hmm. I love the way I was rapping then? Mm -hmm. Or do you look at it as, this is what I was doing when I was a young guy. This is more, you know, what I do now is a bit more mature, et cetera. Like, how, how do you look at that? Um, I, I do look at it as more of a time where I was just, I ain't have a care. No, I wasn't tripping on nothing. I was just going to the booth and trying to kill, kill a verse, right? right. But, but I never really wrote, though, either. 
So I just go in the booth and just kind of do my, do what I'm doing. You were um, punching in that early. That's yeah. interesting because now that's the yeah. norm. But know. you know, people always want to give Jay credit mm-hmm. for that as mm-hmm. if he invented that. But you were on that early, huh? I was on it early, man. And not only that, I was um, I was like, um, so I didn't write then. I write a little bit now, but but technically, I feel like my music is almost better now. Mm. But of course, the fans won't say that. You know, they'd be like, oh, because they stuck in that era. But me, I think I make better music, but that's not to say I'm gonna make sell more records though either. You know what I'm saying? So, but we'll see. Interesting. <laughs> um, what, what, yeah, what, just to jump ahead a bit, like what what are your thoughts on still? Do you feel like when you make a song that you're still kind of serving your fan base from the late '90s or or whenever that era was, or does it feel like you're you're free to do whatever you want? Like who do you feel like you're making music for at this point? Uh, I think I'm making it for. But here's the crazy part. We got a lot of young fans now. Mm. So I don't know if maybe they mom like, oh, you know, you got, listen to this good music. You know how you'd be like, oh, listen to the Isley Brothers or whatever, right? Mm. So You guys would, are, the, are that to those kids now. I think yeah. so. Because we'd be a lot of 19, 20-year-old um, at the concert, yeah. right? You know what I'm saying? And so, um, yeah, I think right now we're making it for, I'm making it for the people who grew up with me, right? right. But then I, but I'm so current right now with the flow and all that. So I still, the younger people, like, I know, I think I was supposed to do something with Lil Baby a long time ago, right? So, it, and, wow. but but the good part about it is somebody like a Lil Baby would, have, he appreciated though. And he knows it. Like, they know exactly, you know, the music. I don't know how they figured it out, but like the French Montana, well, anybody, anybody is like, they'll give you props and they could be in a, uh, a younger generation, but appreciate the music, which I like that. That's, I salute that for sure. Do you put a lot of time and effort into paying attention to what's currently popping in the rap music world or is that something that's kind of you've lost mm. interest in over the years no 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 I, I stay close to it because i'm still around it like i still be um yeah i got a lot of friends that's younger i would say you know what i'm saying and they look to me and they ask questions um and they you know and they appreciate the flow like mm. i so if you look back now and then you look you look back then and look back now i I could rap back then, even though they'd be like, you off beat, but I could rap then, but I also could rap now, too. So, mm. you know, one day I got to get freestyle. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, no, it's good, it's good. For sure. Um, when you saw your brother basically, mm. like, get involved with the streets, were mm. you already in the streets at that point, or was he sort of the, the first one to, to make you realize that this was a real way to make money at that time? I think he was, I was younger, so... The streets were, I mean, I was getting in trouble, but he was in the streets smartly, though. You know mm. what I'm saying? Like, I might be do some stuff like, you know, whatever. But he would be in the streets more to make some money, mm. right? Not to be just hanging out or something like that. I was more in the streets at the beginning, just hanging out, getting in trouble with my friends and stuff like that, which is worse than having a purpose. You see what right. I'm saying? So I think his purpose was a little bit... Well, he's older too, and he knew what the purpose was. Like, yeah. okay, I'm gonna get some money, and however how he did it, he just did it that way. So, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. most people think that they're gonna, you know, start doing crime or whatever, and that this is gonna <laughs> be this like lifestyle thing. Mm-hmm. You really don't want it to be that. You no, know? no, no, no. You no. don't wanna be a bank robber for the rest of no, your no, life. No, no, it would be no. better to rob mm-hmm. one bank and mm-hmm. then be able to do something from there. Not that you should really rob a bank, mm-hmm. but, you know, at least hypothetically. But yet, People who rob banks attend to rob banks again. Oh yeah, you know, so you know, we watch enough movies of that. So, yeah. um, but you know, but it would be good, even no matter how much they, how much they rob the bank, um, they, they could get as much money as they want. The lifestyle would take them. Okay, I spent all the money. Now I got to go back and do it again, right? Um, if you have a purpose and you do something like, okay, I'm gonna hit the streets and make twenty thousand dollars, and I'm gonna stop and mm. turn that into a film or some kind of product or something like that have a purpose though with the streets one mm-hmm. thing that the the whole pandemic ppp loan thing showed me <laughs> is that if you take a person who ain't never had shit yep, yep. and you give them ten twenty thousand dollars they will quickly mm-hmm. separate themselves from that ten twenty thousand dollars because i i over and over and over mm-hmm. will will hear stories about people i know who got a, a good amount of money more money than they probably mm-hmm. ever had mm-hmm. And it was gone like two weeks later. Like that's that's one thing that's really consistent. You see that with people who win mm-hmm. the lottery, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they just blow it pretty consistently. You know. Well, see, it, no matter how much money you get, um, your it's going to end up being the more you're going to spend, mm-hmm. right? So let's say 
if you win a lottery, right? You could never have any money, but yet you win a lottery, you want to buy a $20 million house, right? So, but you could be in, in the hood and not have no money, yet if I give you some money, you are going to turn around and do the, the most, basically, right. right? Like you got, I got football players, I got friends that's, you know, athletes or whatever, and <clears throat> what they'll end up doing is they could be in a dorm eating Roman noodles every night, right? Soon as they get drafted, oh, you got a $20 million contract. They go take 10 and buy a house, buy, you know, Bentley, Ferrari, whatever. And so I just want, I would love to just one day trick the athletes or mm. trick somebody with money. Like, oh, got the PPE loan, whatever that is. And no, you don't have it, right? Because they're going to spend erratically based on what they got in their pocket, mm. which is which is fair enough, though. Right. And even with your book that you're talking about, mm -hmm. you're basically trying to prevent that same mm -hmm. exact thing because that's the same yeah. thing that happens with artists they get a hundred thousand dollar advance mm -hmm. and it's just it's gone and then they gotta figure their shit out from there so the book is dope because um it'll literally tell you everything that you're gonna go through mm -hmm. right so, so you're you gonna think that um first of all this is how you, it's gonna happen to you so you're gonna struggle you're gonna try to figure it out and if you make it you're gonna literally do everything to undo what you did mm -hmm. The first go round, right? Um, you're gonna buy a whole bunch of unnecessary stuff. Um, you're gonna think that you're a Superman because mm -hmm. you're gonna be like, "Oh, I got all the girls love me," right? Fake, all of us fake. Yeah. Friends everywhere. Oh, they got friends everywhere. Nope, fake. <laughs> um, so, it, but what's gonna end up happening is, is it happens to every last one of them, mm. right? You, you're gonna spend money that you don't have, and then think it's gonna be there forever, right? So, I'm trying to give the book to be like, most people will not listen to it. They just won't listen. So you're going to want to have to be somebody who really want to to, to do better. Right. Or you're not going to read the book, right? So, But if you read the book, you will be a little bit more incisive on everything to watch for. So everybody is going to end up being young dudes, too. Oh, this is the other one, too. The streets. Yeah. Uh, oh, man, I, my boy love me. I'm about to ride for him. Nope. <laughs> Once you get caught, you know what I'm saying, all bets are off. And, um, you know, you got some of these young dudes. I wish I could have been like, uh, you know, man, you're doing it too many times, right? Mm -hmm. So before you know it, oh, I got 70 years in jail, right? So how old are you, 17? Like, so you put the math together because on the streets, you're the man. And then you, I would say, you're going to go through that where, come on, you shouldn't be 17 getting 50 years. Like, that's the, the, the economics of that is. You For haven't what? you haven't lived yet, you know For what I'm saying? Because like, you, you shot somebody because you wanted to rob them, or you shot somebody because you had a problem with them. He was an enemy of whoever whoever you're associated with. Yeah. It's just there's so little to gain. Yeah, yeah. But in the moment, mm -hmm. you're so young that it seems like this stuff is really life or death. And in reality, your goal should be to just get the fuck out of that environment. Well, here's the thing: I seen people go to jail and get uh, 14 cent an hour. But yet embarrassed by working at McDonald's. I just feel like, yeah. me, I'm not being embarrassed about nothing if I have to bounce back, right? So the bounce back part is your story is being told based on um, where you end up at, mm. right? Because they could, could be like, oh, Adam, man, you know what? Adam didn't have a job. He was living in his car, right? The, the, the result is going to be, oh, what's Adam doing now? You yeah. know what I'm saying? Is he successful now? And so nobody's going to, the people you think that care about you working at McDonald's or cutting grass or... Um, whatever it might be, right? Because the people, that, once you make it, you hear people say, I, I was sleeping in my car. I was homeless. They're bragging about that yeah, shit yeah, yeah. once you make it. When you make it, yeah. You know? I, I do it. I'm like, yeah. bro, you know I, my rent was $100 a month when Whoa, I first you moved to New York City. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was living in a house with like four other people and shit. You know, yeah. like I have all these, I can sit here all day and tell you about the bullshit that I have to yeah. deal with. Your shit is probably way worse. Yeah, yeah. That shit all becomes accolades mm -hmm. once you make it. So... So you fast forward that, it's some dudes right now who low on money, like, you know what? My light's gonna get cut off. Let me go hit this lick, right? Mm -hmm. But, and then get caught, and guess what? Oh, so here's a go, here's a scenario. This happened too. So you say, um, my kids is hungry, right? My kids are hungry. The light's about to get cut off. I gotta do something. Mm. You go do it, <laughs> you get caught. You don't see your kids for get, 10 they, years. 10 years. The lights gonna be figure out the, they're gonna be okay. The mm. kids gonna grow up be like, oh, you know what? That one time the lights almost got cut off. You're not gonna be here. So nothing is that impulsive that you have to do that. Like I'm telling you, if you walk the walk of it, meaning that 
man, go cut the grass, man. Go, um, go clean up. Adam, how, you, you hired, can I clean up the studio, whatever? The catch is going to be, how does Adam end up? How does, nobody's going to remember that you worked at Popeye's or McDonald's um, or Tyler Perry lived in the car, right? They're going to be, but it's a billionaire now. Hmm. So in a moment, you're going to feel like embarrassed, like, oh, Adam seen me working at Taco Bell, right? But at the end of the day, you, your opinion won't matter hmm. if you have a process to go to. So I worked at, I worked at a, um, car, a car wash place. I, um, I threw newspapers, right? When you get to successful, that's going to be part of the story why you're so great. Mm -hmm. And I, But I'm telling all a lot of young people, stop worrying about people who don't really care about you at all. Mm. Right? Because that's how the, the shit is so fucked up now is that a girl from a bad neighborhood, mm -hmm. whatever, she's 18, 19, mm -hmm. she's looking at Instagram, she's seeing yeah. City Girls, Kim yeah. Kardashian, all these people, mm -hmm. rich as hell, clearly don't have to work, at least in a traditional know, sense. Know, yeah, and they really compare themselves directly to those people, mm -hmm, even mm -hmm. though in reality, it's like those people grinded for years and years to make yeah, the yeah. money yeah. that they're now getting. Mm -hmm. They, Kim Kardashian, I'm sure, would probably admit that if she had like 50 bucks to her name, that she would go work at Long John Silver's, right? Mm, okay, okay. But I mean, a lot of kids, these young kids, <laughs> they don't, they want to skip over that because they don't want to have to deal with the, the fact that they really are what they are right now, that mm. they, they actually are broke right now and yeah. that they're gonna have to work your, you're gonna have to work your ass off at a low level job realistically mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. something going. And that's just reality for most people. But a lot of people don't wanna deal with that because when you open up these apps, it's right there. People living a great yeah. life, jewelry, yeah. et cetera. So yeah. it makes doing some short term shit to get money that much more tempting. You get to yeah. skip over all those years of hard work. Well, here's, here's, what, I, here's what I won't probably do is, I won't blame them in mm. the in the sense if they do it because when I was younger, right. nobody told me I did the the stupid stuff that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Maybe Same. not to the extent. Yeah, you did okay. Well, well, I didn't rob a bank, you but did, you know, yeah, we did a lot of stupid shit to get money. Yeah. Okay, so we we agree on that. So yeah. I won't chastise them about that. I was just man. I would just hope, even though mine my process was um, not as bad. Um, you know, it it wasn't great. Some of the stuff I had to get into to get out right. But end of the day. Um, I wouldn't wish some of the stuff that I've seen people have to go through to impress other people. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Like, I feel like, man, listen, when you get to the, the situation, um, there's a lot of my friends who ain't make it, right? They ain't make it. Um, so they don't have a chance to really be able to um, say, man, I would love to have that job for $5 an hour, right? right. So um, so I, I would want to just tell them to the best of my ability, like, let's fast forward it. You 45 years old or, 60, or whatever you are. You're not the guy you were right now. I mean, even with the everybody, I mean, a thousand women, that's fine too. But it's not going to end up being. It's irrelevant at some point. I mean, whatever, yeah. whoever you dating, whatever. It's, so all that stuff that you're trying to compete with others about, you're gonna wake up and be like, oh, none of it matters. You know what I'm saying? You know what I saw that mm -hmm. was an amazing example of that. Shout out to Birdman. Shout out to Cash Money. Cash Money. It was a clip from the Cribs episode that they did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bro, they had the stretch Prius. Damn. Okay. Wait, was it a Prius? No, they I had think the, it was a, um, the uh, Plymouth one. The uh, the the PT Cruiser. PT Cruiser they yeah, had the yeah. stretch PT Cruiser. <laughs> All these crazy cars, and the best the best part is I seen somebody quote tweet the video on Twitter, and they mm -hmm. said all them cars together worth about ten grand right now. It's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. I That's like that. a good way to put it in perspective. I like, I like that. That's good. Now, granted, these guys were balling out of control. They had mm -hmm. enough money that if they wanted to blow money on yeah, yeah, having yeah. a stretch PT cruiser, yeah. it is what it is. Mm -hmm. But that really puts it in perspective. Like, mm, you know, that, like that. that money could have gone into houses. It could have gone into like art. It could have gone into investments and stuff. Like they might have had enough money to blow, and it might have been good marketing mm -hmm, for the music mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. The average person making that mm -hmm. decision is just absurd. Like, you mm -hmm. know, and, and even I have friends who will, who will be like, Oh, you know, I can't decide if I want to get this 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 car or mm -hmm. this apartment. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's like, bro, you need to move up out of the area that you live in. Get the yeah. fucking apartment. Worry yeah. about the car later. Yeah. Like that, yeah. you, the flexing should be the last of your worries right now. Yeah, yeah. What what that and that's kind of what I I want to do more of. Um, and I, you know you know what it was? I was afraid to tell the young ones that it's okay not to be the toughest guy in the world, right? Mm -hmm. It's okay, um, you know, to take the harder way out right um, it's okay to have a, a, a ten dollar belt on that's you, not bad you don't need the four hundred dollar belt right now if you can't afford it now if yeah. you could afford it all day four hundred dollar belts yeah no, no doubt but <laughs> some of them are trying to live like the 
the Puffs and Rick Ross, mm -hmm. and they ain't put the work in. And that's the part where, um, you know, you mm -hmm. have to be careful because they they have places for people who like to shortcut it. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like shortcut. So, yeah, it's crazy, man. So, 100%. Um, mm -hmm. The narrative mm -hmm. in the No Limit uh, Chronicles thing is basically that you guys left New Orleans because shit was just getting too real on a, mm -hmm. a street level, mm -hmm. too dangerous, mm -hmm. et cetera. That's mm -hmm. pretty much true. Um, it was getting real. Um, that was true. Um, I, and I think when you live in a place, um, you know, if you back home, you're going to have to um, live a certain way. Um, you're going to also have to, um, what can I say? Um, they're going to worry about what you're doing every day. They got mm -hmm. people who you grew up with, like, let me see what Adam got on. What's he doing? Oh, so it's the perception where we, you have to always do your best. Whatever That thing I was telling you about, about impressing somebody that don't really care, right? right? So when we left, yes, it was getting crazy because it was the murder capital of the world. It was like people dying every day, our friends losing their life. But it was also the pressures of the music wasn't what we wanted to do, mm. but also the pressures of, um, um, I would say, um, you know, having to deal with the family. And when we, went, when we moved to the ca California, nobody knew us. Mm. So we'd be, we'd be wearing the same clothes 10 days in a row, mm. right? But we would stack our money. We back at home. Oh, somebody, I seen, I seen Adam in that right there. Oh, Adam got to go in the store, yeah. pay his little money, because you, you want to impress your family and friends, right? We took it. We was on the sleeping on the floor in the back of the store. We was doing um, whatever. Cut, cut your phone. Cut, cut your phone. <laughs> it's like a phone from the 50s. <laughs> Time out for you. Um, so, so, that, so when we left, the hustle was better because nobody knew. Mm. And we was just... We would sleep on the floor. We would sleep in our auntie garage in the back of the No Limit record store. Um, and we wouldn't have a problem with it as opposed to nobody seeing us do it, right? So, um, and that's kind of why we moved. It was, it was this, the element where it was getting really bad. Um, you couldn't even leave out your house. Um, being from one side of the streets and the other side of the streets, whatever. And then you had the part about financially, and then you had to worry about um, the peer pressure and the music was different than we, we want to make music like, um, you know, real good music. Like they was doing the, the bounce music and the pee popping music. And we want to kind of do like heartfelt music, mm. like, you know, group to struggle music. But did you really even know anything about Richmond, California when you did move out there or was this pretty much a total surprise? So here's what happened. This is going to make you laugh. So, um, what happened was, um, me personally, I would never thought about going to California, right? So what I did, I remember watching this magazine, right? I think it was the DuPont Registry, right? So remember those books? Yeah. So yeah. I'm looking at DuPont Registry, and I'm like, oh, my God, California is like, it's nice. I mean, because, you know, in our neighborhood, is the trees are rotten. Um, um, no, gra no green grass. Well, you see a picture of, like, Santa Monica, <laughs> and you think that that's all of California. Yeah, it's all sunshine yeah. and beaches, right? Got one better for you. You you see Beverly Hills. Oh, yeah. Imagine, yeah. imagine opening the DuPont Registry, you see Ferrari. Mansions, I've never seen a Ferrari, yeah. right? So, you know, it's, it's, kind, it's Monte Carlos and Cutlass is where we're from. So, so what happened was um, imagine seeing for the first time, like, real green grass, palm trees. It's like, oh, my God, this is crazy, right? And... Um, end up when we figure out a place we want to stay we're like yo i'm i'm like when they say california i'm like oh i can't wait to go to california it's gonna be crazy um palm trees women you know half you know here nobody's wearing a bikini no everybody's <laughs> doing none of yeah. that right so we like okay cool and um when we thought about moving to cali we like cali's this is cali right got to richmond california <laughs> <laughs> 10 times worse than New Orleans. Like, right. So it was one of those shock, co culture shocks for us. It was like, oh, snap. We, we, we left the hood to get in the hood, to be in the hood, basically. Right. Yeah. And was, it, <laughs> was it even worse, though, because all of a sudden you're in an environment where you don't really understand the politics mm. of what's going on. You don't know who yeah. gets along with who. Like, yeah. back home where you're from, it's probably an easier yeah. riddle to figure yeah. out, right? Well, that's exactly what it was. Um, it was, in, it was uh, imagine you know where you at. So you... You know, you know the 
streets, you know your your enemies, whatever. Right. Here, you don't even know about the culture. So we didn't know about gangs and either. So mm-hmm. gangs, imagine that. So you're coming into Richmond, Oakland, and you know, you kind of don't know. So everything is seems like a trap, right? So the guy coming up the street with the cutlass with the triple gold Dayton's on is like, who is he? What is mm-hmm. he doing? Um, you see people hopping out, you know, with the trench coats on, whatever. So it was more like trying to walk on eggshells to try to figure out who was the movers and shakers, how do we move. And so it was just crazy, but um, it turned out, turned out to be cool. The first couple of weeks it was kind of a little, little crazy, but then once we kind of settled in, it wasn't as bad. Do you think it was ultimately a good thing for the music that you guys were making at the time? Oh, yeah, 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 no, no doubt. Because when we got to Cali, we was in the streets, but then – we had we we started getting a little bit trouble, and then we had to um, well P had to kind of figure out some other options, and then me, I'm like got in trouble too. I went to Richmond, California, which is funny. I went to Richmond High, okay. so the actual Rich uh, Coach Carter that was my real coach, okay. right? So if you could imagine, that's where I was. That was actually one of our teams that the movie is written by, and um, so I was right into the environment of the streets, but also um, the gangs, I ain't know about gangs, so I'm like, they're like, you're, you're a crypt, you're a blood. I'm like, I ain't really none of that. <sighs> so it was more like that, but just kind of, it was a good shock for us because it gave us something to write about as far as the, the music, um, and we had to make it. So we would hustle, uh, try to figure it out. So it, it ended up being good for us. Mm. Yeah. This whole time, though, like, you've experienced so much success, mm-hmm. lived a lot of different places and stuff. Mm-hmm. You always feel like New Orleans guy at the end of the day I mean, yeah, it's a big part sure. of your identity yeah new Orleans for sure you like, still stay out there i do stay out okay. there back and forth uh i'm here a lot too but i'm really out there too a lot but yeah new orleans for sure um yeah it's, it's a um yeah i mean I, i'm glad i went to richmond because that gave me um some balance mm. and then i'm glad to be from new orleans because the culture there if they love you they love you and they right. rock with you, you know what i'm saying so yeah it's dope and then i think um yeah, other than that, yeah. I mean, I've been some other places too, but like Texas is one that's mm. that has definitely played a good part of molding me into who I am. Yeah. Anytime I go to Texas, I'm like, I live here. These people are so nice, friendly, nice, so nice. great, yeah. such a uh, amazing environment. Mm-hmm, yeah, hundred mm-hmm, percent. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna ask this at this point in the conversation. Mm-hmm. It, it strikes me that there's something special about New Orleans because mm-hmm. when you look at it. Mm-hmm. I consider NBA Youngboy to be one of like the rawest, you realest yeah, rappers mm-hmm. that we got out right now. Mm-hmm. When you look at his musical career, mm-hmm. how how influential it clearly is on the on the younger generation mm-hmm. in particular mm-hmm. in that area, mm-hmm. and just how surrounded by violence and, and craziness. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. wh- what do you think of that? Like, does, does, to me, in a lot of ways, he kind of seems like almost like the perfect representation of the city in a way because he he sort of like represents like a, a, a real degree of like anger and, and frustration and, and such that I feel like it speaks for a lot of the young yeah, people in yeah. that area. No, I think, man, he's one of the dopest ones and I'm glad he's from the city, or the state too as well, because um, he does embody that. Right. Um, he does embody a young guy who's trying to figure it out, uh, make good music, relatable music too mm. and um just talented man I, I don't think he reached his peak i mean even though he's super big i think he got a lot to go to man so it's gonna be it's gonna be dope to watch that process too mm. yeah but in a way when you look at him mm. do you sort of see where you were at when you were a young man in many ways yeah i see it in a lot of artists man that's why i i mean this is this we were having this conversation with like somebody like a little baby mm. way before he blew not way before he blew up but he about his first or second song. Just cut it off, my boy. <laughs> <laughs> just, that's fine. Just, just the side of it. Just press the side. Just t- turn it down. Yeah, turn least. it down. Turn yeah. it down. It's fine. You know how to turn it down. Oh my God, you're messing up Adam's show. But um, no, it's okay. <laughs> but no. So, so um, um, no. I see a lot of them in me for sure. Um, just and not really knowing what to ex- expect. That's mm. that's that's. Man, I'm I'm watching him and I'm watching myself because when I was, I was I was messed up. I was like really confused, like really. And so watching him trying to figure it out, I hate that he had to go to jail. Um, I'm just hoping that he he be okay because he's such a good talent. Um, but he also got a lot of people pulling at him trying to figure it out. And I think um, 
I, I really do want him to figure it out and stay because we'll be missed. Like they was trying to give him a lot of time, mm. and I'm, I'm I'm glad they didn't give it to him. I'm glad they let him out. I'm hoping that you know he he gets together because such a great talent. But you you know you could do something and just be like they'll take you out of it. Mm. Um, like you know somebody like a take care or something. It's like you know they he he just he wasn't even there yet and he just gone and you know too much talent. Uh, I, I would like to see them just. Um, yeah, be young, but also know the curve too. You know what I'm saying? Mm, For sure, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when when you look at the motivation that mm -hmm. you had to make something out of yourself, mm -hmm. to a lot of people watching from the outside, it's like it's almost impossible to mm -hmm. separate your story mm -hmm. from the story of No Limit as a whole. Do you think that you had the motivation, or do you think that you would have figured it out to be a, a, an artist, or do you feel like you needed that? machine sort of moving along to show you that you even had that potential or did, did you believe in yourself that you were capable of nah, that from the beginning no nah, no nah. i didn't believe in it and i'll be honest so i'll be honest with you so that's you know whatever so the catch is i didn't i didn't think i, I didn't know about that um when i first started rapping i was more of the person who would like to be behind the scenes mm -hmm. <clears throat> but i would say um I didn't know. And so the the machine <clears throat> was developed and it helped me because I would have definitely not pursued it as much. So I probably would have did it playing around jokingly, but to watch the machine be built. And yeah, I had a lot to do with it, but I wasn't that hands on. I had a lot. I was probably more of, um, you know, creative, but also being helpful to mm -hmm. it. Right. And so I would say the machine helped me develop and keep going. Maybe I just did one album or two albums, right? But the machine made us go on tour, made us do stuff with um, Snoop and Mystical and all these guys. So, and then it made you perfect your craft. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's why today is like, you know, um, me even going into films or me even going into um, the book stuff and me even doing, um, it's a lot of good stuff that spawned from being from the No Limit. like. Um, and having a brand where we was always trying to outdo the, the other people. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it, it, was, it was good. It was good. Yeah, definitely. Um, around what time did you start to feel like you guys had made it? Like there wasn't really like, like, like okay, we're successful. Because from my perspective as like a fan, I'm, I'm like 12 years old, 1997. Mm -hmm. Make them say, uh, comes out. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is, this is crazy. This is some wild ass shit right here. I couldn't believe it. The videos are nuts. Mm -hmm. Uh, from your perspective, like when, by the time the Make Me Say Uh video comes out and shit, where did you see your growth and your career being at? Like, like what was, what was your mentality on around that era? <clears throat> I think when we did Make Me Say Uh, and then we we had Shaq and some of people, we had Shaq, Derek Fisher, some of you in the video. Mm. Um, I think when we went out, the way we carried ourselves, <clears throat> the way people um, engaged to us, right, like. Um, and then we start selling. Like, I think when we picked up our first big check, it was like, oh, snap. Um, but before that, we was out the trunk with it. Um, you know, we was making a couple bucks, but we wasn't really making money. So what happened was we knew we made it when, I, I, I think when I knew I made it, when um, the album went platinum, um, I hadn't shot no video, maybe one video. And, and it was on every chart, number one. And I think, you know, people was definitely in tune to what I was doing. Um, and then as a whole, it was like, when we hit Makeup Say On and we was hitting the road and people chanting it and we was doing shows, 10,000 people in there, I think that's what, and we got the awards, like the, sh you know, hmm. the vibe and Source Award and stuff like that. It, it was it was dope. It Did was you dope. still kind of feel like outsiders rap wise to a certain extent because there was like a big urge to not give the south the respect that they deserved at that time were you guys fully like accepted in, in richmond and then also like did you feel that sort of like like how mm -hmm. overwhelming was that sort of like east coast anti-south bias that you were dealing with at the time um we did feel accepted and you know it's crazy we feel accepted on the east coast probably way like way more really? which is weird yeah which is weird and we're gonna do some stuff with the east coast i'm working on some stuff right now to to do out there um, definitely, I'm going to let you know about that because there's some heavy hitters that's involved in it. But it's almost like No Limit, um, East Coast, salute. You know what I'm saying? So, right. um, But yeah, nah, the, the East Coast was like one of the first, well, 
when they rock with you, they rock with you. You, mm-hmm. you know that you know that you're from there. So um, they kind of like I, I did stuff with Cameron. I did stuff with uh, like Mary J. Blige. I did. Um, I mean, yeah, it was it was nonstop. So, um, but that was the that was kind of like the love we had from there. So yeah, and I think the West Coast always showed us love, mm. um, and of course the South, you know, that's that's our place. So it was it was always like we had no problem with anybody in the industry. So we was always kind of like accepted, and it was kind of dope to watch. Yeah, mm, definitely. Yeah. The the other thing that people always talk about when they talk about No Limit is basically mm-hmm. how at a certain point the label was putting out like an album a week, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. shit like that, like. Did you observe that happening? And like, what was, what was your thought process of like, oh, we're, we're releasing music at like 20 times the mm-hmm. speed that the average label is putting stuff out? Like, mm-hmm. like, did that seem insane to you at a certain point or did it just start making sense because you had so many rabid fans that were actually going to buy the stuff? It started making sense, like right away. Um, <clears throat> especially when you see um, how it worked and, um, and, you know, probably more like um, success rate of it. So, mm. <clears throat> so if you put a record out, you you put out what twenty records a a year? I think it was more than that sometime. Um, and it's successful. So we had a formula, a dope formula. So you just wanted to work. Um, yeah, it, it was it was something to watch. So I think for us it was more just um, just constantly having that that machine and us motivating each other to just be super great. Mm. And nobody could stop us because nobody would outwork us. So I'm saying so it was stuff. Uh, it might be better rappers, but not our workers, though. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I mean, if you have the fan base that's ready mm-hmm. to spend that kind of money, well, why wouldn't you? Yeah. 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 Exactly. It is. It's interesting how now in the the sort of like modern mm-hmm. internet age mm-hmm. that still people kind of put records out mm-hmm. at the same pace that they used to put records out, yeah. where it's like mm-hmm. a big artist is probably not going to put an album out maybe every year or two, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's like they could put out a new mm-hmm. song every day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, you know, people still seem agreed upon the fact that, you know, a, a more sparse yeah. uh, release schedule is probably better. Which yeah. is, that's, that was the fascinating thing with No Limit, that, like, there was actually an appetite for that much new yeah. music. You know, normally you burn yourself mm-hmm. out doing that. What about, um, so you saying more of, like, they pace themselves right. um, as opposed, yeah, I mean, it could work two ways. I mean, if you're talented, like, I feel like Lil Baby could put, um, Lil Baby, maybe Dirk, um, mm. Some of these, like Rod Wade and stuff, they could put multiple albums out a year, <clears throat> and they'll still do good because people want to, to hear their content. Yeah. Now everybody can't do that, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but some people can, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Once you start getting to a, a, mm-hmm. a, the point though where you have that much interest, mm-hmm. it's like there's a big there's a big premium in leaving people waiting. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Like Drake could put an album out every six mm-hmm. months. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they would do great. Mm-hmm. But then at a certain point, mm-hmm. it's going to be like, oh, people are losing interest because they've had yeah. too much of you. You mm-hmm. know, if mm-hmm. you want to keep yourself at the top of the game music wise, I feel like in some way, do you think that the whole No Limit thing kind of showed that, though? Because putting out so much music mm-hmm. that maybe it did overwhelm the fans at a certain point? Um, I don't know, because most fans would I asked them and they were like, yeah, no, we appreciate it. We didn't have a time to really love the music as much, right? But they definitely appreciated um, having more music than less music. It'd be, if you put out one record a year, they'd be like, oh, nah. But um, yeah, but that's that's what makes our fans to this day um, still kind of, they were so engulfed into the music. So when, when Mystical do something or Fiend or Mia and we all kind of serve on or whatever, we all kind of um, had each other back. So that mm. means if you had a you had a um, third project or whatever, you everybody would jump on it. You had a Snoop project, everybody would be on it. Uh, P, whatever. It does. It just a, was a constant thing. So that's to this day that formula worked. I don't know if anybody could do it um, quite like it, but I'm sure. I, I like what um, some of the labels are doing. I think like Rick Ross and stuff and QC and all those guys, they do a good job of feeding the, feeding you know. The industry so it's kind of dope for yeah. sure um when did it start to feel like maybe things were slowing down a bit with no limit and what what did it feel like the contributing factors because in the documentary it kind of like emphasizes mm-hmm. master p taking time away for his basketball mm-hmm, career mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at some point there was like a lot of artists signed like mm-hmm. when did you start to feel like okay maybe this shit is is mm-hmm. slipping in relevance mm-hmm. a little bit at this point mm, that's a good question um i mean 
I don't people say like the basketball stuff, but I, I don't I don't I don't remember quite. Um, I do remember around that time because then we wasn't focusing on the machine so much. Mm. Um, and we had to figure out some stuff on our own. So and I, it, it's good because if, you know, I think from a point where, you know, you want to do other things. So if let's say if you conquer this, you know, if it's basketball or if it's real estate or if it's whatever it might be, you know, you have the right to do that. Um, and I think that we thought about it. Well, I didn't think about it much. I just was kind of going with the flow. So we thought about it and it was more of um, collectively, what can we do for each other? Mm for our own careers. So it was more like, okay, since some people are not around, we have to find a studio time ourselves. We had to um, pick the beats out ourselves um, and go demand the tracks, right? Mm. And that was, that's when it kind of started slowing down when you had, um, you had to go different avenues to make it successful, you see what I'm saying? So that was like, okay, got it. Right. Bro. <laughs> all right, bro. No, that's not fine. It's all good. But, um, Okay, so at a certain point, did you, um, at a certain, okay, when you guys were mm -hmm. full steam ahead at that time, though, and, and P kind of takes a step back, did you start to feel like, <laughs> like, like, if he had stayed fully focused mm -hmm. on the music side of mm -hmm. things, that it could have kept going and got to even bigger and bigger heights? I, I kind of see Master P as the kind of guy who's like such an entrepreneur that he was never going to be happy. Mm -hmm with just doing one thing like i think as much of a challenge as it is and as much as like you could spend the rest of your life trying to run a successful mm -hmm. record label yeah. that he kind of like did it mm -hmm. and he's like okay what's next I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do something completely left field i'm gonna i'm gonna go back mm -hmm. to these basketball mm -hmm. dreams i had you know I, I feel like in a lot of ways if he had been willing to be puff who completely stayed focused on music oh, you know he I built other saying. businesses but he stayed focused on the music for the most part you could say that about you know a lot a lot of different people like mm -hmm. like do you think that if he had really kept his head in the game to a certain extent mm -hmm. that maybe the no limit would have become even more of a dynasty um that's hard to say i, I wouldn't put that much pressure on him but what i would tell you is um you know sports is a full-time job Mm -hmm. So and I and I noticed for a fact because I almost dibbled and dabbled in it and I was um, playing. I remember like this close to M NBA, like I was really good. Right. Wow. And when they when they said um, it was a friend of mine and they was like, you should play for this team. And, you know, we was I was always around all the pros and we was playing every week and blah, blah, blah. And I could really play with them. And it was like, you should try for this team. And they basically said, well, you can make this kind of money. Right. And but. The money part was so little. It was more like, at that time, seventy five thousand for the whole year, right? right? So think about it. So I was making hundred and hundred thousand dollars per show, right? Wow. So, but you got to go to training camp. You got to train. You got to get better, right? So you got to do all these things, and it's hard on your body. When I tell you, yeah. imagine going. I was playing against some of the top players like Stefan, like Penny Hardaway, like you know the kind of abuse your body takes you, you know like it's it's tough so you you were alongside him with this opportunity when you were already a famous rapper yeah i was close i was close but he, he pursued it i feel like that goes under discussed because yes it is crazy <laughs> that master p went and tried to join the nba mm -hmm. but it's even crazier if his brother was like basically doing the same thing people should acknowledge that that's a pretty wild well, situation you know, more. I, well they, they you know they they put me as a back burner but we coming for him you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but but the crazy part no the crazy part is no i was I was, it was crazy as far as basketball wise. And so, but that's how I know for him to pursue that dream. I'm not, I think you could pursue it. I would have pursued it if I know him now. Um, because you tell yourself, you know, oh, I, I played in the NBA, right? So that, that's a good one for the, the record books. But, um, but if you don't, but at that time, maybe P was more like, I made a whole bunch of money. Let me try some other stuff. Mm -hmm. And he has the right to do that. He put he put the brand on his back. Sure. So, so end of the day, but I know as somebody who was right there, who played every week, who was re accepted by the NBA players, right? Um, I'll be the only person allowed in the gym that wasn't the NBA player. That type of that type. That's how good I, I think I was. Really? And so, and so I could have done it if I would have just spent a little more time getting training. No doubt, I'm definitely good enough to play in there. But when I realized how, how much pressure 
and how much, um, man, um, the wear and tear on your body, the travel. Uh -huh. Like, you can't just be like, oh, Adam, I'm, I'm going to play this week. I'm going to be home next week. They, they 82 days, almost like one day off, maybe. Yeah. Like, you, you have to travel. And that's how you're going to do that when you waking up, you're training two times a day, um, and you got to work out, put shots up to be good at that. I don't know how that would, you could do those. I mean, not, don't, don't get me wrong. You could do a film and then do music. You can right. do sell cars and then do music. But rarely can, are you going to see a basketball player be successful at rapping, mm. but fully committed. Like Shaq, you know, no, get me, wrong, get me wrong, take it back. You could probably be a basketball player and then be a part-time rapper, right? Because mm. you just, because Adam got his studio set up, you could just hop in there. Anybody can make a song. It's all good. It, yeah. No problem. Yeah, it yeah. Takes you twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of people, you know. <laughs> yeah. Any, but to actually like really, yeah. I mean, Ooh, when you tough. really like look at what the life of a basketball player Ooh. is like, it's almost amazing that anybody is capable of doing yeah. that. Never yeah. mind also balancing yeah. a, a real deal pursuit of, of being famous as a rapper where realistically if you're a rapper and you want to be the biggest rapper you can be you know if you have a, a free wednesday next week yeah you should be figuring out something that you're doing that wednesday yeah. to try to make your music bigger make yeah. some money etc yeah. like i mean if, if you're a basketball player then you just don't have a free wednesday coming you don't have up a free you, wednesday. you no, have no. everything's booked no. up yeah. yeah yeah and and that and that you just nailed it so i would say i salute him for doing it because um that is something that he has probably had a love for both of them. So, nah, but if it ain't so much about the money, it's about, you know, enjoying and doing what you got to do, then that's a good one. I'm just telling you, when I, when I try to pursue it, I was like, oh, my God, this is this the travel. Mm. Like, you think, I mean, think about LeBron and them schedule. It's like they're rarely at home or anybody basketball player. Think When he talk about it, he's like, and then as soon as you stop it, you have to start it again. Yeah, Like, it's not like... And but to be the to be the best at that is training. And you tired, you gotta sleep, you gotta walk, you got family, you got to your babies. I'm just thinking about that. So um And I think if you ask most of the NBA players, if you were like, hey, how about this? You could just give this up, you could be a rapper, and you can get paid a hundred thousand dollars to show up and rap your music for an hour. Mm. They'll be like, Yeah, 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 I'm 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 done. Because mm -hmm. like realistically, earning yes, you can make a shitload of money as an NBA player. Mm -hmm. But the lifestyle is just always going to be so much yeah, more yeah. brutal. Mm -hmm. The injuries, you know, as a mm -hmm. rapper, like, what, are you going to get injured? I mean, mm -hmm. being a rapper could be a very dangerous yeah. job, but you're not going to, you know, trip and break your ankle and then yeah. your whole career is over. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know, yeah. like, mm -hmm. the, there's just so many. And I always hear that about boxers and UFC fighters and everything. Yeah, it's true. like, if you don't have to do this, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to be able to do this. Because you see over mm -hmm. and over, a UFC mm -hmm. fighter becomes famous. They're mm -hmm. in movies. They start losing. Because it's you have, you have to be an animal yeah, to to yeah, to, to yeah. stay competitive yeah. against all these other people who mm. want nothing more than to just be something. Be something, yeah. You know, yeah. So, no, that uh. that that's no. You just nailed it. Um, you you really in that profession because most some rappers, I mean, some basketball players have tried to rap. Yeah. Um, and they, I think some of them could be successful doing it, but for the most part, yeah, it's the the level. Like you said, being an animal, you can't really take days off. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Like to do that, you if you ain't working out, you working out, right? right? So, you know, so or if you ain't being the best in your craft, you trying to be the best in your craft, right? And anybody who's tried to do them both, like you say, oh, okay, what what part when um say Mike Tyson decided he was he wasn't really Mike when he could just wake up in the morning and he feel like he can beat everybody up, but right. then the other person is being technical. So they training three hours, five hours a day, or let's say um, it's Conor McGregor or something, right? He fell off as soon as he really, really started See? having money and See? success, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it happens it's, really consistently. It's consistently. And so, that's why we look at somebody mm -hmm. like a LeBron mm -hmm. in such awe, because it's like, where does that inner fire come from to keep getting up and keep going for it every day when you don't have to work for the rest Ooh. of your life? Now, granted for him, he might see the end in the distance here. You know, he might think, you know, realistically, mm -hmm. I'm only going to be playing a couple more years, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it might seem like it makes sense. Obviously, yeah. he's making an absurd amount of money to compensate him mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard to imagine somebody really being able to excel at both. So 
LeBron is a perfect person. Um, and I think I had a time to be around him a little bit. The few and the level of balance is unmatched, right? Mm. So it's like if you if LeBron could be a rapper, like yeah. he'd probably be a person that could rap and play basketball. Um, but he he finds the time to do both. So what he what he does is like I say, everybody has 24 hours a day in their time, right? So he probably don't sleep as much. He has a you know, wife and kids. But the desire to, because when you get that kind of money, you, you're going to be like, well, I don't have to go this week. I can go next week. Right. He wants to go every day, and he will just cut everything off and work out. And if you want to be great, that's how you got to be, right? Mm-hmm. So, But most people, I haven't really seen somebody um, – and I seen it up close and personal, so I'm like, oh wow, this is. It motivated me because I, I walked, I watched him in the gym. I think I went to UCLA one time, watched him in a gym, and he was playing like he was a rookie. Like he was like, he won every ball. He mm. jumping on the ground. He rebounding everything. And I'm like, yo, you know, you've been in the league for 17, 18 years, right? Or 16 years. You know, you could relax. You could. No, he playing everybody hard. He trying to. Go to the goal hard, but I was like, that's that's really motivating because he's practicing how he wants to play all the time. Like Kobe was like that too. Like, like I, I, Kobe was the same way. Whereas like he would um, he would just play everybody the same way. Adam, put your clothes on. He, but Adam can't play that good. He, he's stringing them up. He's gonna dunk on your head, make you feel embarrassed, hmm. and he doesn't feel bad about it, right? right. And so um, and that's tough. That's that's one of those things where. Most people don't have that. Most people don't have that instinct to, if you step on my playing field, it's lights out for you. You know what I'm saying? As long as we're on the topic, <laughs> were you around when Master P uh, challenged and allegedly beat Michael Jordan in a game of basketball? I wasn't. I heard about it. He told me the story on the podcast, and it, oh, always, I did. it okay. always blew my mind. Okay. And he said he was with a guy with Hot Boy tattooed on his face, which... Now, knowing more, the, having just watched the No Limit Chronicles, mm-hmm. it seems like there was probably a lot of people named Hot Boy mm-hmm, at that time. Mm-hmm, so it could have, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. I, there was one particular Hot Boy with it on his face, I believe. Uh, my cousin' name is Hot Boy. I don't know if he have it on his face. It's though. crazy because I know a couple Hot Boys too that ah. are, that are definitely not <laughs> related to this. That's just kind of a common name. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah <laughs> these yeah. days, these days, you guys were early on it. <laughs> um, but we, so you weren't around for that, but you heard about it. Yeah, I heard. I heard about it. Um, yeah, I heard about it. It wasn't around, quite around for it. Yeah, but, right. Yeah, I'm saying you weren't impressed, or was that was that mind blowing? Uh, is to it? You at is all? it? Was it a shooting contest, or was it a? a, a, a I think they had a little like two on two or five on five or something. I forget. Yep. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's impressive. That that you know that's definitely I heard about it, so I can't put my my name on that one. But that'd be impressive though, for sure, for sure. Hundred <laughs> percent. A little skepticism, I sense, but okay. Um, <laughs> this is something I really wanted to ask about. Is uh, you know, obviously uh, your brother C Murder mm-hmm. has been away for how many years now? You, you Ooh, too, too long, man. Too, way um, too long. I would say about. I think he got out for a year, but total in like um, maybe sixteen, maybe sixteen years, seventeen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When you see Kim Kardashian coming out on Twitter and making a statement, telling mm-hmm. President Trump that he needs to free, uh, former President Trump that he needs to free, see murder, et cetera, <clears throat> what starts going through your head and, and how much of a surprise was that to see, you know, probably the most famous woman in America taking a specific interest in your brother's situation? I mean, I thought, you know, like, man, at this point, um, that system down there, whatever help we can get, it's, it's like, it's okay with me. Um, you know, to me more, and here's what I heard, she really believes in him. Mm. Like, she, and she's not playing, um, you know, lawyer. She she was working on a case for quite a while with nobody knowing. I think the, from what I heard, um, she's only brought it out to attention by, because they was, they was trying not to give, suppress evidence. They were trying to suppress evidence. And so she okay. had to use that. But I mean... Because two of the two of the witnesses are recanting their statement as yeah. of a couple of years ago, saying mm-hmm. that they were basically pressured, or forced to to incriminate your brother. So the fact, Adam, like this is um, this is true. Like, forget that's my brother. Let's just forget that's my brother for a second. Let's just go on the side of just innocent and guilt, yeah. right? That's it. Innocent. Like I'm talking about. If you read the transcripts, you'd be like, "How is he in jail?" But it's Louisiana, mm. and so. 
Um, I'm sure Kim probably was a person that was like, oh, he's probably good. His, his name's C. Murder. He probably did it, whatever, right? If you read, if I gave you one paper to read, you'd be like, oh, my God. Like, how's an innocent person? But it's clearly innocent. I'm talking about the guy who's who they, they got the DNA from, evidence, everything, doesn't even match. They got the evidence. You can go look it up. They know who did it, actually. So... Um, they won't let them submit it to, to you know, in court and stuff. But the person that, they, the person they believe oh, they did it is alive. Yeah, um. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Pretty much. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna go on record and not to give any clues out, but let's just say, yeah, somebody else totally did it, right? Right. So when you see, and here's why I think most people, um, I see, have support no matter what. So let's say if he did it, didn't do it. Um, what most people have to realize is that. He really didn't do it. And and I think some yourself could be like, oh, it's, it's he murder, you know, he'll be all right, he in jail, he's tough, whatever. But if you read the actual fine print, you would be like, it's injustice, but it's it's sad because so many other kids and parents gonna have to deal with that being like, listen, it was a, if everybody in the club say, oh, it was a white guy, five foot three, right? Mm-hmm. But then you wrestle about somebody six foot four, how injustice would that be? If that, you know, that's that'll be really injustice, right? So that's how bad it is on paper. And the system just won't allow him to be free. He he they they threw it out one time, but they picked it back up. Right. But you gotta think about it. And not to be a race thing, but it was twelve white jurors that convicted him. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, end of the day is I've never seen anything this one sided. Um and so anybody but anybody with influence looks at it and be like, well, that could be my kid or right. brother or sister, right? Because it wasn't like, oh, we got, they got no evidence, no forensic. They have nothing that could tie them to it. They don't have a witness, right? So what did, was you in jail for? Like the witnesses recanted it because they were scared. And, you know, this is a tactic from our city where they scare you, take your kids away. Mm. Um, and so I think we have to fight for not only C, I think C is going to be okay. He's going to come home at some point, hopefully soon. But the thousands of kids that was before him, that they could just be like, oh, Adam did it. And then they got 30 this years because the they can't afford it. the tactics that they use on oh, no. kids all the time. Yeah, it's just this is a high-profile example. You know? Yeah, and I think he needs to come home based on that to where it could be a level playing field. Because you got some parents, kids who are good kids, who, who look a certain way, and they be like, pull them over, put the evidence on them, and they'd go home. Public defender, never see light of day again. And I think C could be for those people, because the system going to change eventually, but mm. I think he could change it. So, And I think somebody like a Kim probably, what I heard is that she really believes and read it, and um, and she's all into it. So I don't know, you know, all of us could help. Um, all of us done a lot. And I would say myself, I would say P did a lot. I would say everybody did a lot, but that system there is so tough. Um, you need to bring awareness to it. So mm-hmm. I feel like that's 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 what it is. Well, we should definitely hope that Kim Kardashian, now that she's not married to a rapper anymore, that she doesn't lose this fire to help out think, the rappers. I don't, so. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I think, I think she, at the end of the day, she wants to be a real lawyer. I think she's yeah. doing it for... Um, you know, her dad, and, and that's something she wanted to do. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's what it is, not not from what I see it seems like that. So, yeah. Would you describe yourself as as still, you know, angry about the fact that your brother's had, you know, a couple decades worth of his life taken away from him? Like, h- how do you deal with just the, the overall feeling of, like, how unfair the situation is? Like, how, how, how do you deal with that? Like, how do you... How do you try to, you know, remain in a in, in touch with him? Uh, mm-hmm. Is he, has his mental state for the most part stayed pretty strong over the years? So in general, C is a very very strong person, right? Um, probably definitely stronger than me because I, I would have been the way he operates. Um, he doesn't let anybody see him stress on it. Mm. He'll be like, oh, whatever, I'm good. Um, only thing about him is that he have kids, and I think the the jail probably is not the hard part for him the the time is hard for him so you if you got he got three daughters uh he got three daughters um and he loved them more than anything so he if he could make sure they was okay and stay in like he would probably do that but being in jail and being a person who really loved their kids um that's the part that makes him that hurts him the most probably Mm. um everything else i don't think but besides time going by 
um, probably is not anything that he has to worry about as far as that. Mm. Um, they love him for being real, but at the same time, we want to see him home. Um, you know, just get back to living because you got to think about it when when somebody like that is in jail. Um, you're doing time with them, no matter, it might seem like you're free, but you know, you, you worry about them, you want to do stuff for them. Um, yeah, so it, it's one of those things where I'd rather see them free. Um, and it, it's a toll, it's a, definitely a toll, yeah, for sure, yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. In terms of what has you motivated mm -hmm. these days, I know I was listening to you in another interview, you were talking mm -hmm. about how you still tour all the time, mm -hmm. you get a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. to play and stuff. Mm -hmm. What are the other things that uh, you're motivated by in terms of your career, in terms of your family, et cetera? Like, like what, what are the things that really uh, keep you excited about life these days? So I'm more, I'm more motivated now than ever. I think that for a while I was, I was really good less motivated because I was like, well, I did every, almost everything. But then this new stuff comes up now and it's like, oh, I think I could take it way further, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know how much we made or I made, <clears throat> but I think I can make 10 times as much more than I made, right? And um, so I would think just doing, um, having products and having a um, book, having films, touring, um, business, um, without with my ability to learn to hustle, um, to know the hustle is priceless. So I think like, and I'm, I'm doing stuff right now that you wouldn't believe. Like I'm like, I'm blessed to be able to, um, to still be able to do what I'm doing, right? It, it's, it, like I said, we touring, um, shout out to, you know, everybody, Mia from Serve, uh, Mercedes, them, um, being, you know, all those guys, it's been good to um, be a part of, you know, having, the ability to do some other stuff with no limits. So mm. going back to, you know, give them their flowers, you know what I'm saying, and appreciate them as well. Um, everybody who's with us, man, it's so many. A uh, Mac came home, free Mac. Saw well, that. he's Mac now. Yeah, he's that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So um, Mac free now. Mac free. Mac free. Exactly. Backwards. They it's say. backwards. Yeah. I heard that a few times before. I realized. Oh wait, yeah. Yeah. He's, so he's sick. okay. Yeah. So he's good. You know, it's just it's it's a good space to be able to do the unthinkable and then be able to give them their flowers while they're here. You know what I'm saying? So dope, mm. dope, yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I really appreciate you coming through and uh, mm -hmm. giving us a bit of perspective on mm -hmm. everything that you've been mm -hmm. through and stuff. You yeah. got crazy ass mm -hmm. stories, some amazing music. <laughs> uh, could we see you dropping like a full project? Do you still aspire mm -hmm. to do that? Or, or mm -hmm. what, what are the things that you're trying to release in the near future in terms of nope. creatively and whatnot? So I am, so we, we got a, we got a, um, I'm doing a project called Vito, but I got another project too, but um, the Vito project is big because it comes with a film, the music, and um, and so what, what's good about that is people like Mac, uh, C, um, shout out to V90, all those guys who we grew up with, that's what they call me that. But when you see what the significance of Vito is, what it is, you're gonna be like, oh, okay, I get it. So um, so yeah, just doing more music. Um, what else? Um, definitely got into the entertainment space. Um, the touring stuff is really good. Mm. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's, that's pretty dope. Everything. Uh, everything. For yeah. sure. <laughs> he said for sure. Definitely. <laughs> well, hey, man, I appreciate you coming on mm -hmm. here. I hope mm -hmm. that everybody uh, uses mm -hmm. this as an occasion to go turn up your catalog, mm -hmm. make the streaming check a little bit bigger mm -hmm. this month. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, man. Thank you so much. And honestly. I appreciate you having me, man. I, I like your show. Watch it a lot. Um, Definitely was able. Glad I was able to come by and yeah, man. Yeah, definitely hang out with you. Appreciate it. It was an so, honor for sure. sure. So yeah. my guy. <laughs> my guy, Silk the Shocker, No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. It Check is. us out on YouTube, streaming services such as Spotify, Apple Podcast app, etc. Mm -hmm. Like, comment, subscribe. We on Patreon too. Patreon.com slash No Jumper. Like, comment, subscribe. No Jumper.com if you want to support. Appreciate y'all. Let's go. Let's go.